say thanks for coming, everybody, to our panel session. Um, first to cut to the cutting edge, uh, learning and development in the enterprise. Uh, learning management's an awfully big market. Uh, IDC put it at 2.4 billion, <coughs> and that was in 2014. Um, a, a Burson survey that I read that just came out, uh, he surveyed 3,000 CHROs, and 84% cited reinventing L&D as a top priority. There, there were only two things ahead of L&D. Uh, one was building a leadership pipeline, and the second was engaging and retaining employees. Uh, if you ask me, both of those relate back to the, the topic we're going to talk about today. Um, a, a recent Gallup poll uh, stated only 13% of employees are highly engaged at work. You know, to me, that seems like an L&D issue as well. You know, yet, there are 600 uh, vendors and suppliers, uh, some of who are up here joining me today, that are selling solutions to, to solve the uh, L&D uh, I don't know if I call it a crisis, but the, the L&D opportunity. Uh, we have the overwhelmed worker. We understand the, the skills gap. You know, if you, if you were to ask me, the, the Boston guy in me would tell you an alternate name for this panel could be why people refer to L&D as cold dead fish instead of sushi. Right? I, th I think there's a long way to, to go for sure. So what we're going to do today is hopefully provide you some insights as to why this is the case. Um, talk a little bit about who has the power to do something about it. And then finally, um, peel back and take a look into the future. You know, maybe provide some wild predictions on what we think uh, L&D will look like five years or ten years from now. So just to, just to pull the audience a little bit, see who we have. How many people in the audience here uh, are from educational tech companies, HR tech companies? About three, maybe twenty percent. How many people from um, investment, investment firms? A few from investment, and then what about uh, you know corporations, companies? A couple, and then higher education institutions. Okay. How many people are enjoying ASU GSV so far? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna open the panel by uh, in, in for this one question. We'll we'll go down the line. We'll start with Patty. Um, when, when you hear the term learning and development, I'd like to know what are the first two words, just two words that come to mind when you hear L&D in the context of you and your position, and then when is the last time you engaged in your company's uh, L&D investment or LMS offering? Formal programming is the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and the last time I participated was uh, we had launched a new program for director and above people at our company. It was a mandatory program. And it, we had a vendor delivering it, and we literally suspended it after the, mm -hmm. the first day when I was sitting in the back of the room because it was just like crickets in the room. So at that point, I knew we were going to embark on some kind of major shifts in how we were approaching educating our very busy people with limited time. Thank you. Company. Carrie? Uh, probably uh, transitioning, uh, transforming are the two words I'd think of. And the last, uh, I run a training business, so I am constantly in sessions. But the last one I was personally in was uh, in January, and it was a simulation. So um, where you ran a company with a new strategy model, so it was very interactive, hands-on. Excellent. Hillary. First two words that come to mind, uh, investment and asset. Um, investment because it's the individual's time, the company's money, sometimes the individual's money, and asset because once you have it, you can kind of take it with you and, and have it help you on your journey. Um, and then the last thing I did for learning and development personally, I actually was sponsored by my work, but I took a six week long improvisation class um, at a comedy theater in San Francisco. Excellent. <laughs> Dave? Uh, my kids, uh, I, I'm on a race to solve as many problems as I can before they have to uh, sort of wade through this. Yeah. And uh, the, the last personal uh, course uh, I did was uh, Gordon Ramsay Masterclass. It was fantastic. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so let's mix it up a, a, a little bit. Uh, you know, please don't hesitate uh, 
uh, jumping in. I'll, I'll pose questions to individuals, uh, and then I'll pose some questions to the panel. And, and from the audience, if you like something here, don't be afraid to give us some audience feedback. You know, jeers, applause, you know, and, and we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper. So, Patty, going back to the title of this session, mm -hmm. um, if L&D was working so well, it probably wouldn't be the first thing cut. Why, why has L&D failed? In, in, you know, particularly in Europe, why has it failed in so many companies? Not all, but it's failed in so many. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would use the word failed. I might look at it as, and this goes to what Carrie was saying about um, transition, that the way that we've funded L&D has been through these largely classroom-based programs or even blended learning programs that are actually quite expensive and not really scalable. We have like 26,000 people in um, over 100 countries. And so the whole logistics of getting people out of a very busy, fast-paced job to get out of their, their office for two days is just not po even possible anymore. Cancellations and things like that. So I think um, that's one piece, is that the model itself isn't really fit for purpose in the way people work today. The second piece is that um, people learn differently. And so a lot of our population are living on, you know, using Pinterest and Snap and Uber and, and Spotify. And so when we say to them, sit down in the classroom for two days and we're going to have a sage on the stage directing content at you, it's not the world that they live in or that they want to live in. And so we're, we're seeing enrollment and interest in those kinds of programs drawing up. Um, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, so. I mean, even if, even if you look at the MOOCs, there's a, a lot of courses that people sign up for, and there's just the incompletion rates are going off the, the charts. It's huge. So, Dave, how would you respond to, to Patty's challenge that you heard? You know, um, it's, it's always interesting, the titles that they give it. I mean, you, you yourself tried to retitle uh, our panel, and uh, <laughs> I think it was interesting. I've never heard the analogy, the dead fish versus sushi, but <laughs> so much of this challenge is actually about the framing we give it. And so, you know, those, those challenges she's talking about, if we can, we, we, we just have to reframe. And so I think uh, hearing the last um, things we did personally as, as part of our L&D is interesting, but inside companies now, you know, the lens and the framing by which we give this equation and this problem is, you know, what do our people need to know here and now to be sex successful at this company? And, you know, what do we, are we going to force them to do? And then sort of what are we going to um, ask them to do, and then what things are we going to empower them to do? And I would say we could probably fit most vendors' products and conversations sort of in that framing and in that lens. But if you zoom out and take a different framing and a different lens and look at the average employee over the course of a year, whether it's compliance or it was just sort of uh, administered to or asked or whether it was empowerment and truly you know, great development content. But you zoom out and look how much of someone's learning in a given year was administered to them by their company. And we now have uh, enough data to answer that definitively and it's about 2%. And so here we are, we're having conversations, and we're asking these questions, and we're trying to fight through the future and wrestle and solve it and figure out what the next iteration is. And yet we're, we are more or less having a conversation uh, of, you know, here at this conference, optimizing 2% of, you know, the equation. And we need to reframe it. And we, we need to reframe it around what is 100% of the learning that people are doing and then bring it back to, and what does that mean for the organization? How do we calibrate it? How do we optimize it? How do we get line of sight? How do we maximize it? So who's responsible for making that happen? You know, I, uh, mm -hmm. how, how do you get this to happen at scale? Who, who, who's ultimately responsible? I believe unequivocally the employees are, you know, um, but I don't know that there would be consensus on, on yeah. that. Does anybody have a... Uh, taking that, who's responsible? Yeah, I do, and I've, I've put a lot of thought into this, and, yeah. and I'm going to disagree with David, um, even though I love everything he's doing at Degreed. <laughs> I think um, 
really it's whoever has the most data on what do you need to learn. Again, I was talking about it as an investment. I mean, for an individual, even if their company's paying for the learning, it's their time, which, you know, everyone has a lot of stuff going on. So even if it's just putting time in to learn something new, they need to be sure that they're learning the right thing. And I think it's the individual's responsibility to take control of their career path, but in terms of, you know, the average shelf life for skills having between two and five years, an individual doesn't really know what they're going to need in five years. I mean, potentially some do, but I think companies can see a little bit further down the road and see we have um, this set of jobs and skills going away and this set coming in. So it's kind of up to them to, to point their employees in the right direction and help them learn the right things and really take control because otherwise I think you're kind of in, in this vacuum not knowing exactly what you need to learn to kind of move yourself down the road. And, and enterprises, I think, even benefit from this because if they have to hire the new talent, it can cost them up to 250% more than, than if they just trained their existing talent. So I think to some extent, it's, it's on the enterprise to help the employee figure out what they need to learn. So, so Carrie, following up on that then, um, what is the one thing that a company can do today? Right? What is the one thing that concretely they can do today uh, to prepare for the talent that they need for tomorrow? You know, well, I, I'd like to take a different perspective than the other panelists because I've actually been the CLO of five different Fortune 500 companies, so I know what it's like to be in there trying to plan the budget, plan, uh, uh, you know, for the needs of people as well as the needs of an organization. So, and I think that the tough thing is the balance because if you're a, a CLO and you're, you treat as your only customer the executive team, you're going to naturally end up, which is the case right now, amongst training budgets, the, most of it goes to management development and, and leadership development. And then we leave this vast, you know, uncovered, essentially, you're on your own kind of thing with maybe a few guidelines. On the other hand, I've gone into companies where they were already doing these bottoms up analysis of, you know, people saying, what do I need? And then collecting that and doing, you know, big statistical analysis on it and so on. And still, the number one desired course was the seven habits of highly effective people. Um, second most desired course was how to manage your boss. So, so what know, can we do? So, so I think we have to strike a balance between those two. Like, I think we have to help uh, people understand where is the company going. So I think a model of this is AT&T. So AT&T said, by 2020, 30% of your skills are not going to be relevant to who we are going to become. So here's a curriculum that you can go through. They lined up a degreed program with uh, Coursera and a university to offer a software development program for people at a very low price. They said, here's the kinds of experiences you should go collect, and tried to get people ready for, and they did that two years ago, so they were doing it five years out to say, here's what you need to do to get ready, and you're kind of on your own, but we've set up some ways for you to go do it, and they, they did set a mandatory course of here's who we're going to become. So I think this balance between a company saying here's where we're going, so you can adjust whether you're going to fit and your skills are going to fit, then informs the person so that they're not just randomly picking, and I think Seven Habits is a great course, but I'm not sure it's going to be the one that prepares yeah. you for the future. So we're, so talking about how these initiatives get funded, if you look at L&D, um, it's managed out of a cost center. Um, Patty, should, should L&D be managed out of a cost center? And is ROI the, the right metric? How do you measure ROI? How do you know you're being effective? And, and if, if, if HR is not the right place to manage L&D, where should it be managed? Well, I agree with Carrie that we spend a disproportionate of our budget on leaders. And the reason we do that is because we still have the mental model that the value creation in the company is amplified by leadership, which it is. However, as we move into a world where people collaborate and share in very different ways, and there's a lot of experts out in the network that we are unaware of, the way that we assess value in the contribution of an individual, I mean, we still are still using the three by three matrix, which drives me crazy. Um, so one of the things that I've really been focusing on is how can we actu actually figure out where the value is being created in our network outside of our leadership teams, where, which who also do a lot of value destruction, right? One, one unkind word from your manager really is demotivating. Um, 
And so by doing that, we can enable uh, a view into the informal learning and sharing, the kind of people that Hillary was talking about who, uh, you know, who are actually having a major factorial effect in our organization that we don't even know about, right? And what's sort of scary for enterprises is that those people, those people that are always helping others and looking out for other people and going the extra discretionary effort to help others and to make the world better are often the people that can go and leave and go elsewhere if they're not recognized in these traditional uh, ways of rising up through you know, Fortune 100 companies. So for me, my mission has been to actually create a learning ecosystem where we can get a bird's eye view into who's sharing, who's collaborating, who, in the net, who does the network think is the most valuable person. And in that way, we can get at a different kind of ROI outside of, oh, we spent you know, $150,000 on so-and-so speaking yeah. at some executive conference. So, so it looks like we're gonna still manage L&D out of HR, which is okay. Uh, but so that brings up another thing. You, you, your comments made me think of something else um, around mobility. So, you, Dave, um, employee mobility in L and D is is portability at odds with corporate goals? How, how do you how do you put your head around that? Right? You have Patty making a massive investment at Shire in L and D, uh, but yet, you know, I think what a lot of employees want is portability. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate uh, that, that one. Uh, Degreed's ethos is very in line, so that uh, um, feels really well suited. But I mean, so Degreed helps individuals take all of their um, career and lifelong learning forward with them across universities, across employers, across learning platforms. And so it does create portability. But there is a tension that that creates, which is we are investing in our employees, you know, for the here and now, but also enabling them for what comes next. And that's a new paradigm. I think, you know, uh, Reed and LinkedIn have uh, been a big advocate for the tour of duty and, you know, investing for not just the here but the beyond. And I think, you know, um, organizations, I do actually believe, are getting more comfortable. And there's a leap of faith, but you inherit an enormous set of benefits. And that is, you know, once you are investing in the individual, and the individual is empowered in investing in themselves, you know, and they are oriented to the right goals and objectives and content, and they are engaged in that, I mean, that solved like two-thirds of all L&D's problems right there, and, and companies are then able to inherit the, the goodness and the data and the development of that employee that is engaged for over a longer arc. And so, you know, it is a bit of a give and take, and there is a bit of value traded there, but net-net, certainly, Organizations that are willing to invest that way in their employees inherit you know, way more value than they are going to lose. And if you look, um, for those uh, who sat through the uh, McKinsey presentation last night, you know, it showed um, both flexibility and upskilling are now um, higher rated than compensation. You know, so I mean, it is becoming a nice to have, and it's turning into a must have for organizations to operate under sort of this paradigm of, of a longer arc. So then how do you, how do you measure success, Carrie? How do well, you measure you, success? I, I think one of the things that we talked about on the phone ahead of time was that I think, uh, yeah, and I've published articles on ROI of learning, so I've been in that space. Um, I think we focus too much, that, that that's no longer the story of how we should think about what learning and development does. And the reason is, is it's always backwards looking. And it's backwards looking assuming then that, it's, that, that the future is gonna be the same so you can rely on that ROI to justify your next program. And I think we need to be much more focused on where is the business going and what's it gonna take for us to have the skills to be ready for that. Um, and, and I also believe that we need to get out of thinking of it as a cost center in HR and think of it as how are we ensuring that we have the, ta the talent to prepare this business to go compete in the future because yeah, in that study and others, people have said um, one of the biggest worries that CEOs have is that they won't have the talent to fulfill their strategy and their mission. So if we're just sitting around justifying how much we spent in order to get our budget and get our headcount that we want for the next year, we miss out on this huge opportunity, which is like the AT&T example, where they looked out, which was not driven by L&D. L&D got on board after the fact, um, but it was driven by the COO. Um, so, you know, how do you get... How do you get to where we're going and help people get ready for that? So I think it takes 
a really strong partnership with the business and not a mindset of a service center inside HR. You can be in HR, I think that's immaterial. I actually, I, I've, uh, as head of uh, learning and development, I've been in every direct reporting relationship you can imagine, <laughs> in and out of HR, it doesn't matter. It's who, who are the alliances you build and the connections you make to understand where the future is for the business. So, um, Hillary, you, you talked about employee ownership, uh, you know, their role in the process. Uh, clearly very important. Um, so I, I can feel my, my daughter hit me over the head with this question, but, but let's, let's look at um, types of people in, your, in an organization um, and look at um, uh, people with more senior level of experience at mentors and then look at millennials. Uh, you know, some people said, I, I, I don't know that I've ever heard it publicly, but some people say millennials can be rather high maintenance. So what is the expectation of the millennial in the workforce with regards to L&D? Yeah, I think that there's this concept of, you know, millennials learn extremely differently from everyone else. I think the only, the major difference that we have um, is, you know, instead of signing up for a course three weeks away when we need to know something now, everyone expects it to be mobile and to be now and to, to be able to do that. But I, I think it doesn't change the fact that, you know, Millennials want to advance their career. They, you know, apparently have 15 jobs by the time they enter the workforce and the time they retire. So I think this this idea that being able to have a portable kind of learning equity that you can take around with you is is really important. To Dave's point, LinkedIn's doing the same thing. We're kind of requiring you to bind your LinkedIn account with your LinkedIn Learning instance so that you can take that around with you. I think. Micro learning was a really big buzzword, which people kind of interpreted as, oh, millennials have a really short attention span. They can't pay attention, so let's just make the content shorter. I think that's actually completely wrong. And, um, you know, there's, there's get the work done, and then there's the long-term career um, learning that you need to do, which is kind of the long-term career paths. But in the end of the day, I think the, the job of, of kind of HR and learning is to make sure that content's available, make sure it's available in the format as well, uh, for mobile, as well as kind of the in-person training, but just allow them to kind of learn on their own schedule. So f f for the panel, what do you think it's best to make our workforce up of? If, if you had to choose one, do, do we want smart people or do we want learners? Do you have to choose? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think, <laughs> well, I think smart people are learners to some extent. I think um, what we've seen is, the jobs that people have now probably didn't exist in the past and that's just going to become more and more pre prevalent. So you need to kind of learn how to learn. And um, I think if, if you have the kind of learning mindset and the growth mindset, then you can just continue to build up your skills. So um, we ran a survey, SAP, with Oxford Economics in 2016. And we asked uh, C-level executives what they valued most in employees, and we had on there, you know, a solid education or qualifications or, you know, a, a set of a dozen skills. And the number one, by a long shot, that they picked was a continuous learner. Yeah. So I think the environment for the future is you, you, you have to be, because I, I believe you can be smart and think you're so smart that you're the mm -hmm. smartest person in the room and you don't need to learn anything else because you already know yeah. everything you need to know. And so I think that person is doomed um, in the future. I so can, can you hire for that or can you build that? I mean, I think, I, I mean, I, I, I was at a conference last year and someone, they were whiteboarding like what is continuous learning and people were putting up all these things about what it was and I said, it's the people you hire, right? It's people who are innately curious, which really, it correlates with problem solving, right? So it's someone that sees a problem and is, motivated enough to figure out how to fix it or get to the bottom of it or, or go and network within the organization and figure it out. I think the really big challenge though, and I would you know, love to hear what the other panelists think about it, and I call it, you know, I was an eco economics person, so I call it shifting the burden. So we in enterprises ask people to go at scale, at speed, faster, faster, better, 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 and then we expect them to also continuously learn. And I heard someone on the panel in here priorly say, grow or you go. Or you go. 
And I thought to myself, is the artifact of a millennial shifting companies every 18 months to 24 months really because they're so hungry and they want to go somewhere new, or because the enterprise is failing to meet its commitment to its employees as human beings who come and contribute? And I think enterprises really should be making a deeper commitment to their people in terms of, you know, to David's point, you know, personalizing some needs of that individual with the expectation that we know we work you hard, we know we want to tap into your discretionary effort, what can we do for you? And I, I don't think we're doing that well enough. And I think we need to do it by implementing systems that are frictionless, that make it easier for people to access learning, but also, you know, whether it's a learning wallet or it's just giving them time in their day to learn something new or to be mentored. You can't just add on and never have a stop doing list or a takeaway list as an enterprise. It's just, we see it in society, right? We see it with our kids. We're cougar enterprises, right? We're, we're trying to like drive, or tiger enterprises, trying to drive our people crazy. So I'm really pushing balance. Um, we're focusing on simplified frictionless systems that create, pr create a learning uh, ecosystem that's literally frictionless, everything's in one place, that allow people to pin and collaborate in the same way that they would on the other modern platforms, marketplaces that they're using, that you know makes it easy for them to go back and find things later, kind of basic stuff, because we know they're way too busy. And at the same time, I'm trying to get um, other, through these alliances, you know, if I want to get additional budget for people to buy something like a journal that they like or a Linda subscription, I got to go to the functions in my company and say, hey, will you allocate resources for this? Because the TNOD budget in a 26,000 person company and in your companies are even bigger, can't really fund that nut. Um, no, so doesn't that go back to though the, the whole notion, um, should learning be part of work? Um, who funds it, who owns it. I mean, that, that gets to the, you know, the thread I was trying to pull earlier about should we be managing L&D in a cost center? If, if, you're, if you're out tin cupping all the time, are we fundamentally looking at L&D wrong? Are we looking at employee uh, learning wrong? And should it be part of work? I mean, if you look, look at where people spend their times today, how, how, how do you think about that? Well, I, I, think, I think now you've entered the realm of politics, mm -hmm. and there's no way getting around saying politics because yeah. different countries do make different decisions about how much they're going to help support their workforce development. So you, you look at Korea, for example, and dollar for dollar that a company puts in, they're matched by the Korean government. And, and that is why you see Korea as a country was able to build companies like Samsung and Hyundai and so on, because they have an incredible So you think we have a core cultural issue here in the States that prevents us from realizing what we should be able well, to do? Well, we have almost no funding that comes from a government level or tax credits or anything. But SAP is making so, plenty of dough, right? But multiply that times 85,000 people and try and, you know, you, you start putting money against that and it's... It's a, it's a big cost center, and, and there's what constant pressure. What if you don't pressure. do it, though? What if we don't do it? Well, what that's, of we course, the bad, the bad news. So you do some, but not enough. And you rely on people to go do the rest yeah. themselves. So uh, uh, another topic I'd like to explore a little bit, and that is how do we transfer knowledge from one generation to another? And um, I, I, I don't know if I read a piece in HBS or, or saw a YouTube clip it. Um, Airbnb, you know, hired a, a sage hotel operator to join their, their staff, you know, and, and I, don't, I don't know, um, you know, how old the Airbnb founders are, but the, 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 the gap in years between the, the sage guy that they brought in and, and the two founders was something like 35 years. Um, and the, the, the sage hotel operator was saying how this was just as good for him as it was for them, you know, that, that mutual learning and mutual mentoring that was taking place. Um, and I found that interesting. Uh, any thoughts on that, Dave? How, how do we transfer knowledge one generation to another? Yeah, um, I actually think it's a really pretty interesting topic when you look at the other trends that are going on. And so we've seen the, from the, the last two national census, we saw the average job duration go from 4.7 years to 4.2 years. And so, you know, that isn't, that isn't going to go to zero, you know, and I, I don't even believe in a 100% gig economy. 
Because to do meaningful work, you have to be against a problem for you know, some extended amount of time. So it'll, it'll sort of asymptotically come down. But what do you do in a world where, you know, let's say it settles around 3.5 years and sort of settles there. So on average, we're operating companies that on average turn people over you know, every 3.5 years. And this, the like, concept of institutional sort of corporate knowledge is going to fundamentally like, crack and break. Because you know, how, do you, how do you create institutional knowledge when people come through the door, are there for you know, a time, and, and leave the door? And I think what it's, it's going to shift to you know, is it's got to become part of the DNA of the organization. And so if you think, how do, how do humans pass knowledge from one generation to another? Like, yes, we can, through stories and information, pass some information generation to generation. But you zoom out, and over time, like, it gets baked into us. Like, our DNA is how we transfer you know, our collective human experience from generation to generation. And companies are going to have to, you know, what I think that looks like is it becomes more about sort of the culture and systems than it does the actual information. And I think, isn't that culture, and this goes back to what uh, Carrie was talking about earlier, that's more than a company culture too, isn't it? Isn't, isn't that a culture of, of yeah. how, we, how, how we view this? You know, I, I was at, um, I was at a breakfast about a month ago at, with that the Business Higher Education Foundation put on, BHEF, wonderful institution, um, uh, if anyone wants to look them up. Um, Wes Bush, the CEO of Northrop Grumman was there. And, um, you know, uh, he was talking about how he's investing significantly millions of dollars in community college programs because he can't find enough skills uh, for cybersecurity. Right. And he doesn't even care about which of his competitors may benefit from that. You know, he kind of has this philosophy, philosophy, if you love something, set it free. Um, you know, if it doesn't come back, you know, you can finish that sentence yourself. Uh, but where does the change have to happen? It is, so culturally in the company and then culturally uh, in our economy. I'd love to yeah. scratch that surface a little bit more. I have a couple of tidbit facts, you know, since I write a lot. Um, one, uh, guess how many companies out of the Fortune 500 um, have an average tenure of, of five years or more in their companies? How many, say how many companies out of the Fortune 500 have an average employee tenure of five years or more? So these are the biggest companies in the world. More. Fifteen. Seven. Seventy, sorry. Seventy. And guess what the average tenure is at Google and Apple, which is identical? Eighteen months. That's the average tenure. So when we kind of go into this mindset of, well, if I train them, they're, they'll leave, they are leaving anyways. I mean, just let's face the facts. People are leaving and moving around. So you're going to hold them. There is data that, that shows that if you do train them, they stay longer. So that is the only way to keep people. And if you don't train them, they are going to leave and they're gonna go, they're gonna go elsewhere. Yeah. It reminds me of the, the quote where the CFO is saying, well, what if we train all these people and they leave? And the CEO says, well, what if we don't and they stay? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, exactly. it actually goes to show that if you do train them, they do stay. So you get the best of both worlds right. with that. Right. I think one thing too, and, and I'll, I'll pick on Charlie because Burning Glass, when they do a lot of their data, I'm always teasing, teasing them that it's all about the tech space. And so we're in the biotech space, so we hope our R&D PhD doctors are not going to be leaving every 18 months from our. So I think it's a different, it depends mm -hmm. on the vertical that you're in. Yeah, and so does. depending on what your vertical is, you'll see, in, in, and we find it in, in our functions that are related to IT, we fight to try and get people from degree, from LinkedIn, <laughs> to come and work at a biotech company. So it's very difficult for us. But I sort of think it's, um, and I was very proud of our CEO last year, he made a comment that he said that no matter how, uh, whether someone stayed with our company or not, he wanted it to mean something that they learned at Shire. And that made me feel so happy about what, what we were trying to do because it would be a mark of, uh, an honor to have, have studied at our company. Should learning be managed? Anybody? Yes. It should be. Yes. 
does anybody have the notion that I, learning should I, not be? Managed? I think it should be guided. Okay. Right. Um, you know, and I, 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 okay. Yeah. Gu yeah that's, guided, that's a better word. Guided because, um, as as you guys all know, and I've told Charlie this, like I always tell my, my poor children, I say, life is not a buffet, right? So you're not going to walk in anywhere you go, and someone's laid out a beautiful buffet, and you get to choose what you want from it. You are going to have to build your own buffet. And I think if we create uh, systems in which it's possible, and David's doing this, and LinkedIn's doing this, and you're probably doing this too, where it's easier for someone, we augment their ability to build that, whether you call it a role map or a career path or whatever, they want to be become a cook or something, that we make it possible for them to do that efficiently so that the opportunity cost I mean, my big uh, fight with, and I'm now I, I don't reside in HR anymore. I'm our company's sort of unique in that because I was going around um, evangelizing about what I thought we needed to do in terms of helping our employees be able to continuously learn. I found myself getting transferred into enterprise platforms. So I now don't work in the talent function. I work for IT. And I work directly with the business functions to evangelize about, and, and my evangeli evangelizing is typically, how can we help? How can we help support you to support your people efficiently, to collaborate, to share, and to learn things? And so I think it's a guiding process. And um, you know, I, I think it is a bit of a service center still. So, so let, let me ask again, because what, 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 just thinking of myself, when I want to know how to tune the carburetor of my dad's 57 T-Bird, I go to Google, and, and it's real time. Nobody's managing it. So, so w w w why should learning be managed, Dave? So I think this is a really, I, I feel like in a lot of ways, this panel, the conference, we're able to like, talk past each other on points. Formal versus informal, self-directed versus mandated, compliance regulated versus you know, autonomous versus empowered. Like, yes, 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 and yes, but also no, 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 and no. Like, and, but there is a right and a wrong. It isn't that sort of all of these things have to happen. Like, you, you can do compliance training. And how I would frame it, just very quickly, is there are different sizes of arcs to learning. And if you think about great um, game mechanics, great games have to have different sized arcs. If you think about Mario Brothers, there are mechanics that guide you second to second, jumping on turtles and breaking bricks and gathering coins. There are mechanics that guide you minute to minute, beating levels, going to the next level. There are mechanics that guide you to come back day to day, advancing into the next world, the big bosses. There is an arc that is meant to keep you engaged from month to month, saving the princess. And great games have to have all of the arcs, because if you miss even one of the arcs, that is where your game breaks. That is where people abandon. And you know, if you frame learning that way, there are different arcs. So just in time learning, you cite, you know, working on your dad's uh, Chevy. You know, yes, you can go and watch a Ford. Ford, important. Ford yeah. <laughs> we're, we're a different generation. Your generation, you know, got uh, to get behind the wheel of a car to escape our parents. You know, my generation got to uh, get on our phones to uh, escape our parents. So I know more about phones than I do cars. Um, but I was pretty good at escaping my parents. Um, <laughs> but we, we have to have, you know, we have to talk in terms of arcs. So just in time learning, it has to be. It must be. There is only one right answer. And it has to be the individual. That's where the dollars need to buy, be. That where, that's needs to be where the purchasing power is. That needs to be the center of gravity for decision making. It has to be. There's only one right answer. And I will defend to my death anyone else who wants to take it. But different arcs, there's a different answer. So when you talk about foundational learning, if I want to become a web developer, I don't and can't just get on YouTube and, and co you know, combine enough seven-minute videos to get me there. I can't. There is foundational learning, and I don't know what I don't know. And that's when it comes to the guided and forced and mandated and highly scaffolded. But you know, any organization that doesn't have a strategy and the right answers for every different size of arc, that is how you grade whether or not a company is good at learning. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I, gotta, I wish we had more time. I have one more question, then I want some quick comments about the, the, the wild future. So an important question that we didn't ask is there are going to be lots of workers left behind. Right? I, I mean, there are gazillion surveys about uh, uh, workers and automation. What, what do we do with the workers left behind? 
Well, I think during Michael Moe's uh, talk last night, it was interesting that even going back into, I think, the 1500s, they were railing against sewing machines because it would take away the jobs of the seamstresses making the, making the dresses for the courts. And I think every kind of 100 years, they're talking about the next technology that's going to leave workers behind. And it's true, there's hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs that have gone away. But at the same time, that's, that's jobs, not necessarily work. And so I think it's really important and this is where the kind of managed learning comes into play. As Dave was saying, these, the individuals who are learners, they don't know what they need to learn. So you know, if you say, OK, I want to be a computer or software engineer, that's great. But there's all these people that don't even know what, what options there are, what jobs they're going to be, what skills to, to get there. So I think um, that's where it's really important to come in and have this kind of guided, managed system, be it government, be it employers, whatever you think the right solution is, to have kind of the, the powers that know where the jobs are going to come in and, and kind of guide them and say, this is where you should, you should go if you want to have a job. Anybody else want to take a stab at that one? I, I, well, I think, I, I think there's a word behind. we haven't used that is, I think, the it word in learning and development now. Because um, we keep using the word managed or guided, and I think it's curated mm -hmm. is the word that I hear people really wrestling with a lot on how to, how to curate so that at the individual level, you're not in a random universe trying to connect the dots, even if it's completely your own learning. How can we help curate the content, you know, put, put out there the content that's going to really help them accelerate? And so I think, I think you know, to head to the future, we, we've got to look at the future and begin to curate a journeys and paths that will help people have the skills for the future. Mm -hmm. Because I think skills that are going to be needed in the workplace are shifting. And they're shifting maybe more dramatically than they ever have. OK. And, so uh, with that, let's, let's move to the future, right? Uh, last, last set of comments from the, the panel. Um, you know, um, you know, hopefully some people in the audience remember the Jetsons, right? So if you, if you think about the Jetsons, you know, if I could take off the bookshelf and plug in um, learning on some topic I want to become expert at and it's there automatically, what, what is the future? What is the wild, uh, hair-brained view of the future? I, you know, we'll, we'll go to mine. We'll start with you, Dave. What, what is it going to be that none of us can imagine today, possibly? I believe, unequivocally, the... Um the market wants to speak the language of skills and cannot, so it speaks the language of degrees. And I believe that uh, that will be the biggest shift. Um, and uh, I actually believe until that shift happens, as long as it remains true, tell me about your education and you answer with where you went to university. I believe as long as that remains true, uh, all of the major problems in higher education will persist. So I think that's the, the fundamental shift to taking us into the future. Thank you. Hillary? So I think and there's a lot of tech companies in the room also, but you know, I think AI is a really big part of the future. Um, kind of hearing this word a lot, but in terms of curation, I think we'll be able to see people on a certain career path pull exactly the right content for them. Um, going back to the in, uh, knowledge within the company, how you transfer that. Machine-assisted learning? Maybe? Yeah. The, this, this company, Slack, just announced that they're going, if you type a question into the chat bot, they're going to point you to the exact right expert to answer your question. So I think yep. the kind of AI and the ability for computers right. to figure out what you need to learn. Carrie? Yeah, if we're not going into the too distant f future where we've got you know mesh installed in our brain <laughs> um, that connects us with our environment, but the the the, the close-in future, I think we're going to essentially all be gig workers, um, even if we're in a company. And I think the compensation systems are going to shift to match that. So you you go from project to project to project, even if it's a two or three year project. Um, and and we, be, we all become gig workers based on our skills, just like David said, not, not our credentials, not our tenure. Thank you. Patty? I think we're going to see more and more uh, a, a bigger demand for not just skills, but the ability to integrate those skills in a way and explain to other people why it matters. So if you go to a gig economy, and we've all had employees like this where my kids come to me and they'll say, I want to do this, this, and this. And I'm like, why? <laughs> and they can't explain to me why. That higher order of thinking that lets people explain what they're doing and why it matters. And this is why funding, funding is an issue, to just circle back to that, because if you can't explain why you want $85 million to spend on something, and really articulate it, not even, not in a metric, but 
in an inspiring story about how it's going to affect the organization or the world at large, you need to be able to bring those the skills and the experiences together in a way and integrate them that makes it possible for you to keep employed in a gig economy. And that's, that's what agility is really going to be, is it, is it higher order of learning and integration of concepts. Right. And I, I think we need to have systems that help people do that, not replicate it, not say, I know you don't know this, so I'm going to augment it with AI, but actually that you would interact with the AI in a way that lets you use your higher order thinking to, uh, to, to operate in a gig world. So Thanks, Patty. So I appreciate everybody joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Um, Thanks again.